very excited because of all the energy that is transpiring and all the enthusiasm, and especially because of because this is a project that I've learned a lot from. So that's why it was hard for me to decide what I was going to speak about today. And I've decided I've decided to speak of something dif difficult, which is um, philosophy of knowledge, which is a bit of a social suicide. But hopefully you will be patient and you will support me in this in this endeavor. Well, there's a book by Nietzsche that says, how do you achieve, how do you become what you already are? Because often when I think of Wikipedia and the free knowledge movement, I remember this phrase, how do you become what you already are? Because I think Wikipedia shows some lasting characteristics of the building of human knowledge, or at least its dissemination. How do we become what we already are, even if we often make huge efforts to forget this? So in the last couple of centuries, particularly in the last century, science has become more bureaucratical. As you well know, the word bureaucracy has changed its meaning in the, in, in the years, and it is now very derogatory. Initially, it was very positive. It meant that we were building rationally organized models so uh, aimed at attaining things. However, the result of the bureaucratization of science has been extraordinary. We have built machines for discovery and learning that are quite efficient. And this, of course, has a dark side. This machinery often integrates vertical, opaque, alienating, illegitimate organizations. So you can choose whichever you want, the army, large multinational companies, government agencies, anything you, you, you like. So I think that the success of the bureaucratization of knowledge often leads us to forget that these advances have a very mysterious root. The advances in knowledge have a root that we don't fully understand. We somehow, uh, our intuition tells us that it relates to the way in which humans use communication tools that allow us to develop a shared experience. So we're able to refine um, through collaboration, our concepts, our perspectives of the world to the point that we generate a common subjectivity. Knowledge is possible because there's something in the way we face reality that belongs to everybody and nobody. There are common structures and to things as well. And in this sense, that's how we have in the years developed a very long chain of knowledge which has accumulated throughout a very complex period. For instance, there's a case which I really like to, and which I use to explain this, and it has to do with how for thousands of years the people of small societies in Papua and New Guinea, most of them illiterate, were able to build complex agricultural techniques and today we haven't really been able to understand them, and this has allowed them to survive in a very hostile environment. I think that Wikipedia and the free, the, the free knowledge movement shines light on this collective effort that bureaucratic organizations use but also mooch from. And this is something I want to speak of. Recently, we've fallen, I think, on the other extreme, and we underscore sever, se several characteristics about Wikipedia and free movement and free knowledge movements related to technology and digital collaboration processes. So let me explain. In the last two or three decades, communication technology has acquired a huge eminence in our in our use and dissemination of knowledge and I don't want to deny that technology has opened opportunities that used to be unimaginable for instance editing Wikipedia that we have to admit that but 
digital technologies are seen as a sort of qualitative leap, like uh, the internet is a source of increased collaboration, and I think this is a mistake. I think that if Wikipedia is today the most successful example of the free knowledge movement, it's, a re it's because it has been able to, in practice and not in its self-understanding, these it's been able to evade some of the, the ways in which technology oppresses knowledge. So let's think of Wikipedia's auto-knowledge. It's reflections on itself. Okay, so you might say everyone understands it differently, but I'm going to propose an image and let's see what you think about it. I think there are two essential elements to how we understand Wikipedia. First of all, I like to speak of norm norms, procedures. Why would this come first? Because Wikipedia is the free encyclopedia. In what sense is it, is it free? Well, it's free because it's Kobolev. It has free licenses. It's not a picturesque legal app appendix. Um, this was explained to us yesterday. The encyclopedia would not be what it is if there were if, if there wasn't a free use of its contents, this is why Wikipedia is committed to eliminating the barriers that obstacleize the flow of information, notwithstanding the use of this information. In other words, this is a commitment of its norms and with a strong procedural um, uh, sense. And procedural uh, practices are those that do not consider an a priori commit um, concept that decide whether this concept is correct or not. In other words, the result of a procedure is adequate if we've respected the norms that regulate the procedure. For instance, democratic um, institutions are procedural because in order for the results to be legitimate, we just need the election to have fallen in certain, uh, have followed certain criteria. So if, but that means that if somebody I don't like is elected, it only means I like it, but it's still democratic because it followed the rules. And the same happens with an encyclopedia. It will be free if we respect certain regulations related to its dissemination and creation and use. And the relation of free knowledge with procedural processes was born from the free software movement, but then became part of open access and became part of the conceptual architecture of the free knowledge movement. And I think this is reasonable because the procedural criteria generate consensus in the s because it demands very little consent. And this is very important because traditional collaboration efforts developed by archaic small communities were supported by, on one half, the culturally very, uh, by culturally very homogenous communities, and on the other hand, by continuous, by continuous efforts, people would work together continuously. Whereas digital collaboration projects are culturally and politically, politically heterogeneous, and also occur in episodes. In other words, I edit whenever I can, not all the time. However, procedural norms are compatible with cultural, social, and political diversity that characterize, that characterize our societies. They're very complex. And on the other hand, with non-continual uh, forms of knowledge, uh, open communities such as ours, in other words, they reduce unanimity and consensus to a very, very small minimum. As Bernard Shaw said, the rule of gold is that there is no rule of gold. In the case of Wikipedia, the procedural the, the procedural norms mean that we can continue working even if we don't have a single vision of what a encyclopedia should be. Some people may collaborate because they're interested in open knowledge or in disseminating knowledge, etc. And we don't need to agree 
on a single motive or a series of them because what brings us together is a series of other norms and how these and and how we give voice to certain ideas but there's of course limitations which we will mention in a moment the second series of elements that are part of our auto uh, understanding of wikipedia is well wikipedia is a Co co collaborative encyclopedia and after hearing some people it would seem that Richard Stallman invented collaboration and I'm very interested in how little we think of traditional collaboration or cooper uh, or cooper cooperation we have about 800,000 people who belong to co-ops co-ops employ 100 million people in the world that's many hundreds of millions of people but just to give an example with regards to knowledge in the 70s of uh, there was a movement that wanted to publish uh, an essay by sense Liskit. I, I can't pronounce this but it it motivated the workers to study their their history. So, at that moment, we had about 10,000 groups of workers who studied their own industries, the history of their jobs, and the history of agriculture. They created books, TV shows, and even built museums. I think it's no. No, no coincidence that these types of movements receive little attention in free knowledge movements. We've assumed that digital collaboration implies a step forward with regards to um, to analog uh, co-ops or cooperativism. So, I think, and I think this is purely ideological. In other words, in the last few years, an understanding uh, well. The internet has been understood as a space where different fragments of intelligence form a, a sort of mental hive, and we think that suppression of the traditional restrictions related to intellectual property, technical access to knowledge, may incentivize the creation of knowledge spaces where coordination appears somewhat spontaneously. However, not everyone defends these theses literally, but many do. But these are ideological elements that are, are there. They are latent in our preconceptions of free knowledge. And in this sense, Wikipedia is a sort of crystallization of this general environmental process, because it's true that What's characteristic of Wikipedia is that it proves that on the internet we all contribute to aggregate knowledge through the fragments in which we are experts. Maybe a teenager does not knows nothing about the Rio Tijuana ideological regime, but maybe he can correct uh, the name of a town where the the river passes or something and the moral of the story is that with the right technology micro knowledge and micro and micro wisdom leads to emerging knowledge internet is has this type of magic and it allows for these cognitive cognitive knowledge to group very quickly and without a centralized coordination. I think it's this argument is partially true. We have cognitive life beyond bureaucratic organizations such as research institutes or companies or universities participating in this central structure is not about or not participating doesn't mean you have to be a solitary hero of research, but it also leaves in the shadow other crucial issues related to how we build and disseminate knowledge, particularly its institutional dimensions. But before speaking of the of this, why does this granulated, disseminated idea of knowledge, why has it become so popular today? Maybe someone here will get angry at me, but this goes very uh, in hand with what we believe in terms of the market and 
with the market as a privileged form of social relation. There's a parallel between the cognitive, collaborative environment and the type of collaboration that the market generates. And some people find this scandalous, but I want you to understand this. I don't say that those of us who collaborate in Wikipedia are fans of the free market and capitalism. On the other hand, the ideology of the free market is so general that it reappears in our practices even when we think we are doing something completely different. Let me explain before you start criticizing me. The market is a very attractive form of collaboration because it doesn't require a centralized co cooperation. It doesn't, it's not based on alt altruism either. It doesn't exclude altruism, but that's not the basis for it. And ideally, what the defendants of the system say is that the price system allows to achieve an uh, uh, allocation of resources by providing different information without a central coordination. You don't need people to coordinate commerce. On the other hand, central intervention would only distort the flow of information and impede optimal coordination. So I think there's a strong analogy between some very disseminated versions of collaborative knowledge and this conception of the price market as the ideal form of organizing a collective. So for those most optimists, not my case, once you have the legal and technological frames, you will create an aggregation of non-centralized knowledge. So knowledge would be the result of a spontaneous coordination of information fragments. I believe that collaborative practices such as Wikipedia do not enter, do not form part of this model. Um, the same happens to the market, I think. The thesis of collaborative sp sponta spontaneity has similar limitations to the hypothesis of coordination of spontaneous coordination of the market. I don't think markets are bad in themselves. They are very useful and they can improve our lives, but they have two basic limitations. They are not social universal mechanisms. They are not social universal mechanisms. In other words, not all social coordination s systems can follow this logic. The market is a terrible system when we need to uh, consider common objectives of our lives or objectives related to moral progress, because in that case, what we need is deliberation. We need to sit down and reach agreements and reach consensus and reach unanimity. Well, sometimes we need this. I said we didn't, but sometimes we need it. Second, the markets have social conditions. I'm not saying they should have them. They always have them. For instance, social interactions, parasite care, for instance, markets such as any social coordination mechanism are part of a greater mechanism on political loyalty, similes of family, legal systems, and different types of solidarities that are not rational, and both can apply to free knowledge models. And first, the automatic granular model of free knowledge has important possibilities, but also limitations with regards to its expansion, because also in free knowledge there are conflicts that require deliberation and discussion and consensus, and if we don't do something to stop this, spontaneous collaboration reproduces the established order. If we do nothing to stop this, free knowledge reproduces, for instance, gender bias, ethnic bias, and class biases that exist in our communities. So if we do nothing to stop it, it's always going to be rich, white, middle class, and male. And this has been discussed, and this makes me happy. But second, um, cognitive collaboration is part is based on traditional wider practices. For instance, many people who contribute to Wikipedia have gone to the university or are university students or university professors. In many countries, such as Mexico, educational systems are public, very cheap, and rely on the taxes paid by citizens. What I wanted to say is that Wikipedia maintains a symbiotic relationship with academic institutions 
and with libraries and with what we might call the welfare state. We can take advantage of this strong relationship by promoting the participation of colleges and universities in free knowledge systems, but we need to recognize this relationship and not simply believe it might be uh, a coincidence. Oh, there's a, prof a professor here. Oh, that's what a coincidence. No, 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 it's not, it's not, it's not anecdotal, it's systematical. Well, at the beginning of my presentation, I spoke of a, a, a contrast between hierarchy and competition, and on the other hand, collaboration and distribution of knowledge, and both conceptions have strong limitations. Neither of the two recognizes the sociologically complex nature of collaborative of collaborative knowledge process. Is there a middle ground between the two? I think so. It may be what we call an institutional comprehension of knowledge, because knowledge, like the economy, is institutionalized. And this means that it is, uh, it is strongly tied to the social frame, and it is cross-cutted by cultural political and moral conflicts. In our societies, institutional knowledge and thought is very, uh, has been lambasted by the press. So let me speak in favor of institutions. First of all, I'd like to clarify something. An institution is not the same as an organization. They are two different things. An institution is a way of doing it. It is a series of norms. It is a series of shared norms aimed at certain goal. An, an organization is a collective or organization. For instance, the stock market is an institution. Wall Street is an organization. So it's a subtle difference, but I think it's worth mentioning because institutions express themselves through organizations and collective actors, but they are not reduced to this. So you can be loyal to an institution without being loyal to the organization that through it, it, which it is expressed. If you allow me, I can say that, that the only way of being loyal to a university is by not being loyal to an institution like the Complutense University. So it has to do with the means that justify the existence of an organization than with an organization itself. And as part of free knowledge movements, there's an institutional, um, there's an institutional series of of, of ties. But there's a resistance towards institutional knowledge. The way these institutions understand themselves is per, through their procedures. So not only like this, but yes. So it's like they were on electoral co commission. So we must think of reflecting and deciding. Thinking collectively means deciding on what an organization has to do beyond its procedures. So this means committing to a series of personal values that tie us but also put us in opposition with other organizations. So thinking of free knowledge from this perspective would imply understanding the participation and of, of and how we can have a, a common a common pr uh, let me just say I, I said this very very confusingly uh, I'm going to clarify that Thomas Piketty said recently that in the US the income of parents has become a way in which to predict a, a child's access to university the mean income of parents of students who went to Harvard is four hundred fifty thousand dollars. This is an average, meaning two percent richest households of the U.S. Here in Mexico City, the UNAM, which is one of the largest universities in the world, where more, with more than three hundred thousand people. And does free knowledge has anything to say about these two superimposed realities, Harvard vis-à-vis -vis UNAM? Well, I, I think there should be something we could say probably in terms of organization, but uh, of course from our institutional perspective, because uh, the, move, the well, free knowledge movements are contemporary recipients of an enlightened heritage that 
were for, in the beginning connected to the to stronger position to social and political privilege, not only in terms of epistemolo epistemology, but also in such terms. Kant defined enlightenment as a call to leave our uh, um, age uh, our underage status, but actually Kant was using this metaphor quite literally because, uh, as you know, Kant had uh, worked as a professor and therefore had been part of the domestic uh, service of rich families. Therefore, he had been subject to the patriarchal family um, rules. He had no civil authority, and for Kant, enlightenment implied, uh, therefore, uh, political critique of such uh, servitude relationships not only a process of knowledge, but also a political critique of such servitude relationships. Therefore, the Enlightenment project was historically articulated through the democratic construction of public, well, powerful public institutions, such as public schools, public universities, and scientific institutions. Think about this for a minute. Who was doing science during the 18th and 19th century? The noble, the noble people, the rich people, and priests. That is why uh, they were the, the, they were the, the, those that had a monopoly on science because they had time for it. So uh, science, so enlightenment was the development of political educational institutions also that uh, destroyed that monopoly and uh, enabled new massive forms of cooperation. I think that thinking about Wikipedia and institutional knowledge uh, and free knowledge institutionally is thinking about how we are committed with our heritage. Participating in free knowledge should make us think on uh, knowledge and educational processes that are not only free, but also public, free, universal, and egalitarian. We create cheap computers with uh, educational purpose and novel software, but if we really want all these tools to be effective, we will really have to talk about how those manuals and computers will be used. Will they be used in public in, in public schools, egalitarian schools, with teachers that work in decent conditions, that are also teaching students w that live uh, in decent conditions, or not? The benefits of free knowledge uh, will go to l large companies, or will there be a taxation system to redistribute them? Will this increase? Will free knowledge increase the power of rich countries vis-à-vis -vis the? the poor ones, or will this undermine such power? I think these are the sort of questions we should be asking. And let us, something must be clear. I'm not advocating any change in Wikipedia's projects or any projects for free knowledge. For me, Wikipedia is perfect. I, I'm not advocating a change there. I'm advocating change in those of us that, that participate with Wikipedia, because participating in public knowledge projects uh, demand a uh, faithful a thinking process about uh, how the communication of knowledge has been as a means of e uh, equality. We should not change free knowledge. We should change the world so that free knowledge can be the source of change it is uh, called to be. Thank you very much.